and teachers and guests. Selamat siang. Uh, it's great to see so many of my students here today. Grade 6, grade 8, grade 11. Thank you very much for coming, guys. It's great to see you here on a Saturday. And thank you very much to all the guests for coming to our wonderful school today as well. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm here today to talk to you about a problem and a solution. The problem I'm here to talk about is one that I and many scientists agree is the most pressing problem facing planet Earth and us, its inhabitants, today. The problem I'm talking about is, of course, climate change or global warming. And the solution I'm here to talk about is something that I think is a really, really, really cool and fun thing to do. Actually, it's my favorite thing to do. Uh, in addition to being something that's really, really cool and fun to do, I believe it's the most powerful tool we have in the fight to solve this problem. And the tool I'm talking about is art in the form of literary science fiction. In a nutshell, I'll be talking about how science fiction helps us readers imagine, understand, and potentially even solve complex problems like climate change. Now, I think we can all agree that the climate change problem has been really, really difficult for us to solve, and very little progress ever seems to be made. The way I see it, there are three reasons why this has been the case. Firstly, climate science is incredibly, incredibly complex, and it's very difficult even for trained and experienced climate scientists to understand, let alone us, the population, and our politicians, policymakers, and our leaders. Second, I think as human beings, it's very difficult for us to imagine an abstract and distant future with abstract and distant consequences. And third, I think as human beings, it's very difficult for us to imagine the social, political, and economic transformation that is probably going to be required if we are to avoid climate catastrophe. These are, to put things simply, problems of imagination, or what I like to call a failure of our imagination. Hopefully my TOK students in the room will have understood by now that I'm talking about imagination as a way of knowing, and I'm here to state the case for its importance. For well over a century now, Climate scientists have been observing and studying the climate change problem and have been attempting to communicate their findings to us, the general public, with very much limited success. A century later, climate science still remains very poorly understood by large sections of the general public and even larger sections of politicians and leaders, our policymakers. Um, according to some recent research, nearly all at least 97% of climate scientists, close to 10 in 10, understand that climate change is happening and that we, human beings, are the cause. However, this breaks down when we get to the general public, where only seven in 10, of, only seven in 10 Americans understand that the climate is changing, and even fewer, only six in 10, recognize that we, human beings, are the cause. More worryingly, however, is that four in 10 Americans believe the climate problem is exaggerated by the media. Only three in 10 Americans believe that they are being harmed by climate change right now, which I think if you watch the news is demonstrably untrue. 11% of Americans are doubtful of climate change. And most worryingly for me is that another 10% believe that it is a hoax or some kind of conspiracy. Now, for me, I'm not that worried what the general population think about something like climate change. For me, what's far more important is what our leaders think, our politicians, our policy makers, and decision makers. So I'm about to show you some recent statements made by some of those people. So this is a 2013 tweet by Donald Trump, most powerful man in the world, our most powerful decision, uh, most powerful decision maker, it's freezing outside. Where the hell is global warming? Another one, same guy. 
Global warming is a total and very expensive hoax. Another 2013 statement. And this one is just a few weeks ago, 2019. In the beautiful Midwest, wind chill fact factors are reaching minus 60 degrees, the coldest ever recorded. People can't last outside for minutes. What the hell is going on with global warming? Please come back fast, we need you. Now, hopefully by now, you're, you're all wondering how can something like science fiction and art form help readers imagine and understand the complexity of climate change? On its simplest level, science fiction can act as a didactic yet very enjoyable tool for teaching human beings about what ecologists refer to as ecological wisdom, which is, put simply, human practice that understands and tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of a planet's biotic community. One of the first science fiction works to didacticize and teach us about ecological wisdom was Frank Herbert's 1965 sci-fi classic, Dune. I wonder if anyone here has read this book. Any hands? Fantastic piece of science fiction literature. I strongly suggest you go out and grab a copy if you've not read it or even read it again. Um, according to Frank Herbert, the key to understanding ecology or the key to ecological wisdom was the understanding of consequences. According to Herbert, the thing the ecologically illiterate, and I'm not pointing fingers at Donald Trump here, but the thing the ecologically, ecologically illiterate don't realise about an ecosystem is that it's a system. It can be destroyed by a misstep in just one niche. A system has order, a flowing from point to point. If something dams that flow, order collapses. The untrained might miss that collapse until it was too late. That's why the highest function of ecology is the understanding of consequences. Now, in June, the two planets represented are juxtapositions of ecological utopia versus ecological dystopia, of good ecological wisdom versus bad, good ecological understanding versus bad. And Frank Herbert is quite clear in the book. He lays the blame for ecological catastrophe squarely at the feet of humans, who he claims have been a disease on the surface of their planets for the, since the beginning of time. Ironically, however, Frank Herbert also suggests that it is humans who are the key to maintaining a good ecology and protecting their planets by cultivating ecological literacy among the people and using man as a constructive as opposed to destructive ecological force. Frank Herbert believes that human beings can not only protect a good ecology but even turn a bad ecology into a good one, an ecological dystopia into an ecological utopia. And this brings me to the second piece of my puzzle, which is, as I see it, human inability, even reluctance, to imagine an abstract and distant future. And when I talk about an abstract and distant future, I'm talking about the distant and abstract social, political, and economic consequences of present day actions. Generally, most environmental crises have very immediately perceivable consequences. If we pour chemicals into a river, we immediately see dead fish. We can already begin to see some of the consequences of climate change. For example, coral bleaching from minute sea temperature rise and ocean acidification. But the big and difficult question is, what happens to society if we gradually release an invisible gas like carbon dioxide into the atmosphere over decades or even centuries, how do we even begin to imagine the consequences and answer these difficult questions? More recent science fiction authors, such as Paolo Bacigalupi, known in sci-fi and lit circles as the master of disaster, tend to narrow this cognitive and imaginative gap for us by setting their stories on near future planet Earth. His 2015 novel, The Water Knife, is set on the North American continent where severe drought caused by climate change has rendered the continent completely uninhabitable and even caused the downfall and destruction of the United States and Canada as countries. 
setting the stories on such familiar as opposed to abstract places allows readers to engage in what cognitive scientists refer to as possibility thinking, which is a necessary part of thought, decision making and action that allows individuals to generate in their minds ideas and images of states of the world which are not perceivable with our sense perception. And hopefully my grade 11 students in the room will realise again that I'm talking about TOK and imagination as a way of knowing and how important it is in gaining knowledge. Science fiction authors use possibility thinking all the time. They use it to place readers in future worlds where the negative consequences of present ways of thinking and being are distressingly palpable. And they use these possible worlds and the associated imagery to influence readers to take action on problems. Reading these stories then allows readers, us, to better imagine the social, political, and economic consequences of something as abstract as releasing an invisible gas into the atmosphere over decades or even centuries. And this brings me to the third piece of the puzzle, which is, as I see it, human inability or even reluctance to imagine the social, political, and economic transformation that is probably going to be required if we are to avoid climate catastrophe. Many modern science fiction authors have been rejecting the doom and gloom of ecological dystopia fiction and have instead been creating utopian visions of what planet Earth could be with good ecological wisdom and good ecological understanding. Modern science fiction author Kim Stanley Robinson is one of these authors. In his classic novel, Pacific Edge, he imagines a world where fossil fuels have been replaced by renewable energy sources, such as solar and wind power, and pointless resource wars are no longer fought over these now obsolete and finite resources deep in the ground or under the sea. New science fiction genres dealing with utopia are popping up all the time. A very recent genre is green punk, which focuses on recycling, upcycling, and an ecologically friendly philosophy. Solar punk is another great and very recent addition to the genre, which imagines human so future states through human ingenuity, craftsmanship, and science and technology. Reading these stories allows readers, or us, to imagine the social, political, and economic transformation that's probably going to be required if we are to avoid climate catastrophe. So I hope this afternoon I've given you all a little bit of a better understanding how I believe science fiction can help readers imagine, understand, and potentially even solve the climate change problem. Hopefully I've inspired you all to go and uh, pick up a science fiction book, maybe reread one, um, buy one for a family member, a, a, a friend, a child. Some authors I can definitely recommend are Frank Herbert, Paolo Bacchi Galupi, Kim Stanley Robinson, Ray Bradbury, Margaret Atwood, or Octavia E. Butler. But more than just reading, hopefully I, I can inspire some people in this room to start writing. Um, even just here amongst you all, I know my students are very talented writers. There could be hundreds, if not thousands, of stories waiting to be written. Bestsellers just waiting to change the world and make it a better place. So if I can leave you with one final thought, it's pick up a pen, open up a Google Doc and start writing because I believe science fiction is the best tool we have to make the world a better place. Terry McCarthy. <laughs>